Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Here I am in the red car, no webcam, sorry. Um, what can I tell you about today? It's raining, it's forecast to rain for the rest of the week. I hope you're well. Uh, I had a Ukrainian guy in yesterday, needed a surgical extraction, ended up snapping the tooth off next to it because uh, as I said to my nurse before we started and when we looked at the x-ray this is a root treated tooth with no post so the lower right five was root treated and had a crown on it but they hadn't made a post and core what they done is they joined it together with the crown on the six so the problem with joining crowns together, and it is very popular in Eastern Europe now, we get patients back from places like Turkey where they've had all their teeth crowned. And the six is linked to the five, and the five is linked to the, uh, the four is linked to the three, and the two is linked to the one. So um, it gives you a problem of what to do. You know, if you lose one of those two teeth, what do you do? So, um, So not only did I end up having to do a surgical extraction because it was a root filled tooth, but we had to um, make an impromptu post for the five because it broke off. And that was because he was, uh, he came from the United States and he was flying back on the 31st, which is tomorrow. And so we had to give up some time that we were supposed to be doing our accounts to uh, fix it. But it's forecast to rain all week, and which is a fitting backdrop, because in the Greek and uh, tragedies, if there's something terrible was happening, it, it always used to rain, and it used to have uh, thunder and lightning, very, very frightening, uh, to set the backdrop, you know, for the, the emotion of the scene, the, the, to, to show the audience that what was going on was not a good thing. Anyway, um, so a few things have happened today. They've released a report. Well, they haven't released it. They get they gave it to the. They always give these things to the BBC a day early, so the BBC gets a chance to read through them a day early. If it's a dental report, they give it to the BBC a day early, and then they give it to the um, the dental profession on the day. We don't get a chance to read it a day early. So when the BBC questions us, they've had the chance to read it for 24 hours, and we. We literally have only just read the executive summary at the best. Um, and it means you can't go on the morning news because sometimes they're released at 11 o'clock and it's all embargoed. And they go to ridiculous lengths to make sure that we don't get a chance to respond to these things. They invite us to Richmond House to receive copies at 11 o'clock um, and make sure that you know we hand in our mobiles and everything. So at least that's the way they used to do it. I suppose it's all done on the internet now. But, um, you know, the, the word is that 200 children could have either survived or not had brain damage or physical injury if this Shropshire Trust had not aggressively pursued the absolute minimum number of caesareans to the point of refusing them when, when refusing them resulted in death or injury to the child. And, of course, the Trust itself is a nebulous, amorphous thing and... The trust has accepted responsibility, but what is the trust? You know, the trust is just a legal entity. No, the people, the real people, the villains behind this, you know, the people who refuse to give the cesareans, the people that wouldn't take on uh, adequate staff, uh, the uh, executives and management that were in charge of the service, uh, that, you know, that was providing an, an inferior service because they were monitoring it on using metrics such as number of uh, natural childbirths instead of the number of children uh, who died or injured in, in, you know, as a percentage of children born. Um, none of these people are in the frame, none of them. I mean, where are the, uh, where are the corporate manslaughter charges being bought? These people will have been either kicked sideways or uh, up to a better paying and a uh, job with more responsibility or into the House of Lords or something. This is uh, the way things work, you know, this is corruption. This is the corruption in our system. And um, 
the, the galling thing is that this has come on the back of a similar report about five years ago, which you know was called to consider exactly the same problem and and made recommendations that should have in, ensured that this didn't uh, didn't happen, that it didn't happen, and what. You know, the, the, the standard response to these things is, oh, well, uh, things have changed now. We don't do things like that anymore. Those people are not working for us anymore. Bums have been kicked. Heads have rolled. P45s have been written. Lessons have been learned. All the, all the stuff you know. All the stuff you know. You could do it. You know, <clears throat> the, the, we've been reorganised. We've, we've reorganised. We've got a different name. Uh, it's uh, the rules of change. We've implemented recommendations, etc. All those things that they said that they'd done, and then less than ten years later, we have another uh, 200 infant deaths and injuries. <coughs> so, when they're um, in this report, you know they've looked. They confine themselves to what went wrong at the trust. But what they should have done was they should have expanded the. <laughs> And they can't because they're told. They're told, in my opinion, they are not only told what they are required to investigate, they are also told what they are required to discover and find and recommend. Now, you can call me jaded and cynical, but uh, Ken Weech, who was the parliamentary advisor to the Dental Practitioners Association, said that the government never calls an inquiry unless they know the results. So, and I'm inclined to uh, believe him. He was a, an MP for a long time. Just, just one of the good things about the traffic, about the petrol prices, is that there's a bit less traffic on the roads and people are less inclined to drive fast. So if you want to get to work in a decent, in a timely manner, you're likely to be the fastest car on the road. Anyway, so so what should this inquiry have considered? Well, I think it should have, you know, I, I would start at the top and ask the question that no one ever asked, which is, should healthcare be in the hands of the state? <coughs> you know, we divorced religion in the state, thank God, you know, and we managed to come out of the dark ages when religion was in control of everything. We haven't divorced uh, the state and money we haven't divorced the state and education. We haven't divorced the state and healthcare. Except insofar as there are people like me that are working outside the system and sort of keeping the flame alive and proving that uh, it, it can be done uh, differently and better. But of course we're labouring under the handicap of um, asking our patients to pay for the National Health Service and their private care. Not one or the other. <clears throat> as in other countries, a bit like Germany and uh, France, where, you know, you pay, you pay for the state system and then you, if you wanted something better, you just find the difference. In the UK, we've always been very proud about the fact that you, you pay for the state system and if you want to go privately, you have to find the whole lot again. So, <clears throat> and the reason behind this is that, um, you know, if you take, let's say, you take, for example, a dentist, let's say just he's making a, a denture or something, and you say to the patient, look, I, you know, this dentist's got quite a soft plastic teeth on it, because within the NHS fee, that's all we can afford. That's what's compromised on the NHS. Uh, quality of materials, quality of laboratory work, and the time available. But if you wanted us to spend a bit more time getting it to fit a bit better, take some better moulds, using better moulding material and etc etc then um, what we need is about another 20% on top but as a result you'll get a very good denture <coughs> and you still get your NHS subsidy so it's not like um, you'll feel like you're paying your national insurance for nothing because you will be getting it back you know but the opponents of that system say, look, what you're doing is that uh, basically you're making this patient a private set of dentures and of the cost of that private set of dentures, the NHS is, is subsidising you. We're subsidising you to the 
you know, to, to the extent of 80% of the cost. And it's not the NHS's business to um, subsidise private sector dentistry. If you want private dentists, you pay for private dentists. Don't go with your hat in your hand to the National Health Service asking for uh, some uh, money back, like bloody Oliver Twist. Well, of course, they, um, you know, I mean, those people don't, um, they ignore the fact that <laughs> it's difficult to ask people to pay uh, a tax, uh, which they know for a fact they will never get the benefit of. They will never, ever get the benefit of. The only time they would get the benefit of it was if they fell on hard times. See the old job, the Dickens uh, reference is coming in here. And... Um, and, and had to fall back entirely on the National Health Service. In other words, they, they had no chance of getting treated in the private sector, or at all, anywhere, and so, um, so they had to fall back on state support. And, and the other uh, argument that they always use is that it's not, um, that the NHS would suffer if uh, rich people were allowed to opt out, and that it's only by providing a level of care which is, applies to everybody equally and is used by everybody equally, um, that, um, that the poor people get the sort of care that the rich people would like. <laughs> um, which, again, it doesn't work at all. You know, the rich people not, are not in the NHS if they've got any sense. They're not... Uh, so it's not like uh, poor people ride on the coattails of the uh, sharp-elbowed rich in terms of bumping up the quality of NHS care. That just doesn't happen. So, um, <clears throat> the surveys of the NHS, uh, well, the, the annual survey of the NHS has just been published and it shows that people are more unhappy the, with the NHS than they've been for about 20 or 30 years. And, the, because the, um, the government says, oh, well, we've, we're, we've put some more money in, you know, which is always the government's solution to anything that's going wrong is to do more of it and spend more money on it. Um, so they say we put more money in, but I think um, really what we're doing is we're starting to see the early signs of um, uh, a collapse in the NHS. I think the market will bring down the NHS. It'll eventually get so inefficient, so slow and so expensive that it will implode. And as an example of that, uh, Mrs. Angry, who's broke her leg uh, and needs some crutches. Now she was given some crutches and left them behind by mistake at the hospital. So we rang the hospital up and said, no, can we pop back and pick them up? Oh no, they've gone. You know, someone's had them. <coughs> Excuse me. So we said, well, well, how do we get a pair of crutches? Oh, well, I don't know. You know, you'll have to ring the physiotherapy department. Physiotherapy department says, oh, um, uh, you need to come in and um, be risk assessed. Uh, health and safety requires that you come in and be risk assessed and, and fitted for the crutches. Now, I mean, this is a pair of crutches. This is not a pacemaker. This is a pair of effing crutches, okay? She's been risk assessed for them. She's been given them. She's been measured for them. She just forgot them. She just needs to find somewhere where she can go and pick them up. Well, I mean, our five phone calls later and a lot of like, genuine distress uh, and, and deciding that I can't cart her all the way down A&E with a broken leg just so that someone can decide what hole some little button's got to pop out of to make them the right size. Um, we've decided to order them from Amazon. Oh my god and the, the, the you know the stress I've got on the phone from the nurse who rang back and said look I'm trying to get these crutches for you, but I need to ring someone who's going to ring physiotherapy tomorrow morning because they're not there at the moment. And, uh, you know, and I said, look, the problem's been fixed. You know, I've got a friend called Jeff who says he can have them here tomorrow, a pair here tomorrow for 20 quid. And, uh, you know, probably come with instructions, but if not, I'll go on YouTube and there must be 20 videos on how to adjust a pair of crutches. Just a simple pair of crutches, right? <laughs> to make sure that they're the right size for your height. But no, they're so precious, you know. <coughs> oh, you mean you don't want me to ring the physiotherapy? No, I don't want you to ring the physiotherapy. Oh, well, in that, if you don't want my help, if you, you know, there's no helping people like you. There's no helping people like you. 
So she didn't say that, but I mean, you know, this is the sort of the attitude that, you know, you're, you're, um, we don't want people like you who can, uh, who demand, uh, uh, you know, that things are done simply and quickly and cheaply. We, I want to make about five phone calls and, and, uh, and possibly defer your crutches until your fracture clinic review, which is in two weeks, which will be three weeks later than the consultant has said that you should be up and about on crutches. Compromise, you know, compromise again. Perhaps, perhaps your consultant can all. Perhaps his secretary can all give you a pair of crutches. I'm like, no. I said they're on their way. They're, I've had an email saying they're already in the post. So, and uh, we'll get them and, and we'll fit them. And uh, the uh, bloody uh, precious physiotherapist can go and take a long walk on a short pier, can't they? Because we're doing it ourselves, aren't we? It's the only way. You've got to be self-sufficient, man. All right. I'll uh, I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye.